So Parker, your first time on the ACL stage. How are you feeling? Uh, I don't know, man. I, I'm always real weird after we do things that I was wanting to do for a very long time. It takes a, a while for it to sink in, but um, I'm glad that I feel like the guys played unbelievable. The band was so good tonight. Um, I don't know. That's a, that's a hard feeling to describe that not a lot of people get to truly feel. Um, but nothing short of amazing. So are your songs about the life you live? Or are they about other people's lives? Or are they just kind of like characters you make up in your head? Um, there is certainly a little bit of uh, artistic creativity, maybe making some stuff up. Um, but, you know, from the time I was 19 till I was probably 28, 29, which was only a year ago, um, you know, I was very, very convinced that I had to live a certain lifestyle to write the kind of songs I wanted to write. Um, and I'll never know if that was true or not, because I did live that lifestyle as hard as you can live it. Um, and I did write those songs uh, from that. Um, but it's, uh, I would say 90% of it is extremely accurate and true. I might have changed some stuff around on relationships to make it look like I wasn't the bad guy. Um, but most of it's very true. And if 100% of it isn't your life, it's a life you probably could have led. Yes, and, 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 man, and I was going really hard, especially when I was living here in Austin. And uh, it's really why I ended up moving to Nashville about a year ago, because I had to get out and kind of get away from what I was doing here. And I wasn't writing the songs anymore. I needed kind of the clarity and to clean things up and um, try to write songs like that. And I kind of, buddy of mine, Cody Johnson, told me one time, if you can't do it sober, what do you really have? Um, and so that really kind of resonated with me and I cleaned my act up and still writing songs that I think are good. You've managed to kind of find the middle of the road. <clears throat> and in this case, that's not a bad thing. And I mean, between maintaining your, your integrity and being true to yourself, but also writing songs, making records that also work for a big audience, for a mainstream country radio kind of audience. And it's not like something that's contrived or that you're you're thinking about. It just kind of happens. Yeah, I mean, in, to be totally honest, when I was 15, probably 16 years old, I can remember telling my brother that's exactly what I wanted to do was be was essentially make, you know, make it to the big, big times of country music and writing Chris Knight level of songs, which neither I've been able to fully do, but. I've gotten close. Well, I know you said that you wanted to be a songwriter when you first came to Austin out of high school, and that's sort of how you saw your, your path. But I'm sure you have also listened to a lot of country singers who've been influenced and inspired the way the way you sing now. But So who are some of these other people who you've looked up to over the years? Singers, songwriters, whether they're from Texas or wherever? Yeah, uh, I kind of went through a lot of phases. Um, when I was in junior high, and you know, kids my age did not listen to these songwriters. Um, so it was really my older brother was the only person I knew that listened to them. But, uh, and my older cousins, I mean, they showed me Todd Snyder and Drive By Truckers and James McMurtry and Robert O'Keen and Slade Cleese and Adam Carroll and, um, uh, I mean, on and on and on. Songwriters, Rodney Crow, and obviously Townsend Guy. I have, I'm always hesitant to name drop them because I feel like a lot of people name drop them and probably did not study them quite like they like to claim. Um, that's not for me to judge, though. I shouldn't say that. Um, but I, I, I was really lucky to be so influenced at such a young age and not just hear those songs, but like identify with those records and those artists. And I wanted to be like them and I wanted to write songs that I would always think when I was a kid writing songs in my bedroom, what would Todd Snyder think of this? What do you think it's good? Would Ryan Adams like this? Would John Mayer like this? Would Rodney Crowell think it's good? Would Steve Earle think that this is good? And would my older brother, he's a phenomenal songwriter, would he think it's good? And um, as I've gotten older, I've kind of grown out of that thought process. And um, But you know, after that, I, I got into high school and that's when I got into you know Randy Rogers' band and Cross Canadian Ragweed and Pat Green and um, all these, um, you know, Texas guys that were kind of running the show at the time and really still are and um and then I moved to Austin and uh and I, bought, I went to Waterloo on um uh Lamar and I bought uh Heartbreaker by Ryan Adams I bought um 
uh, I think it's Black and Blue, the Gary Clark Jr. Mm-hmm. album, and uh, and about Continuum by John Mayer, um, and uh, I think it was One Foot in the Ether, Band of Heathens, mm-hmm. um, and those four albums kind of shaped those early years when I was in Austin. I told my parents I was going to school here in community college, and I was enrolled. Um, but I was really just sitting in my house all day, not going to class ever. And I was listening to those records, and I was trying to learn those songs and write songs like those guys. And I got really, really into the Band of Heathens and Shooter Jennings and grew my hair out long. I was wearing big sunglasses and wanted to hang out with those guys so bad. Um, and and so I kind of went through a series of phases. And always, <clears throat> no matter, I would get into other stuff, you know, and, and kind of some different genres or whatever, but I, I never could shake you know, those real songwriters that I had just fallen in love with. I remember hearing Ballad of the Kingsman by Todd Snyder my freshman year of high school and just being like, this is the greatest song I've ever heard in my life. Um, and, and so I just identified with that so much, and, and I wanted to write songs like that, but I, I didn't want to um, let my I'm – making my family proud was, like, super, super important to me. And I knew I had to go be successful at this and support myself financially doing this to be able to, you know, really feel like I, that's probably not the case for them, but for me it was. And um, I wanted to make a living doing it and keep my integrity as a songwriter. And when I signed my record deal, um, you know, I passed on all the money up front that they usually give you. And I just said, man, I just want the creative control. I was like, you can bet on me. I'll bet on myself. I will, I, I want to write the songs and I want to record the songs how I want to record them. And I want to put out the records I want to put out. Um, and nothing funny and nothing goofy. And I want to be an old man and look back and say, I stuck to my guns and did it my way. And when you give that up, you give up a piece of your soul. You do. So you're never the same. So tell us the Saxon Pub story. How did you get to end up on the stage at Saxon Pub? Man, I was living uh, on South Lamar. Um, I can't remember the name of the apartment. It used to be a Wendy's where that In-N-Out burger is and lived right across the street from it. And... Um, I, I just met, who's my guitar player now, I met Brady Beal at Pooties in a Walt Wilkins songwriter competition that neither of us won. And uh, he came over afterwards and said, man, you're really good. And so we started hanging out, and um, I had been going into the Saxon Pub with a fake ID and listening to Walt Wilkins every night, every Wednesday night. And uh, I was just real close to where I was living and um, ended up meeting Jody, who's the owner of Joe Abel's son, uh, daughter, and uh, she found out I was not 21, and she's like, you come in there all the time, what are you doing? So she made me wait till I, and then I was about to turn 21. So I turned 21 and um, was allowed to go back in and, and uh, be in the bar. And um, I was in there one night, and an old friend of mine named Ashley Monocle um, introduced me to a guy named David Cotton after her show there. She'd played after Walt. She said, you got to meet this kid. And um, David said, well, can you play tomorrow night? And I said, Man, dude, I know like six songs that I could play tomorrow night, but I'll, I'll do it. Sure. I just told him yes. And so I just met Brady Bill and I called him. I'm like, dude, you got to split this song with me. We got an acoustic song swap because I do not, I, don't, I can't do this by myself. <laughs> and um, so the next night we went in there and um, we played. Uh, it may have been the following, you know, I think it was just a couple of days later. It was really quick. I mean, Brady split the show and then Jody allowed me um, to kind of play Sunday nights at midnight when they were putting up the stools. And I mean, there's nobody in there. I mean, it's like a, basically just a rehearsal by myself. Um, I did that a few times, and then they gave me the slot playing after Walt Wilkins on his day nights, um, and it would be packed out for Walt, and then <laughs> his show would be over, and everybody would leave, and we'd play to Jody and two or three people, and um, that's uh, one of my favorite places in the entire world. And I, I knew when I came to Austin that you know I had to be playing Saxon Pub. I had to be playing Pooties. I needed to go play Green Hall as you know to try to meet guys to start a band and guys who wanted to write songs and that's how i met corby shop he was playing for ryan bingham and the dead horses ryan which bingham. was my favorite yeah. artist at the time still absolutely is and uh um met corby one night after a saxon show went back to his house and i'd just written a couple songs and uh played them for him and he said man i'd love to produce your record and i said well i don't have any money to make a record he said well let's make an ep so we made an ep and all that came from Jody letting me play those little shows at the Saxon. I was telling my friends who didn't know what the Saxon Pub was, you know, I'd be like, dude, I'm playing the Saxon Pub, you know, like, it's a big deal. And we weren't playing for anybody, we weren't making any money. Um, and uh, 
it would be Wes, the door guy, and Jody would be cleaning up behind the bar, and they'd be, you know, hanging up the stools, and I'd play for an hour and get done about 12, 30, 1 o'clock, and still be nobody in there and go home and just was on top of the world for getting to do that. So my last question is, when you play a live show, whether it's here at Austin City Limits or at a stadium in Dallas, there's 20,000 people, what do you hope that the people who come to see you take away? Maybe people who never saw you live before, who don't necessarily know all your songs. What is it you hope that they get out of you and your, your music? You know, what I hope they get out of me would, would absolutely be gratitude. Um, I've been thinking about being a country singer for as long as I can remember. Um, and and I, I, we did it the hard way, and we did it what, what I think is the right way, and um, started from the very bottom and got a van, and or started in our truck and got a van and then got a nicer van and got a tour bus, and now we got all these tour buses and 18-wheelers, and, and, I, and I, nothing has changed for me. I don't feel any different, and I'm extremely grateful to have gotten to do this and, and grow and and uh, we've never stayed stagnant it's gotten a little bit better each year um, so gratitude I hope they can just understand how truly grateful I am to get to, get to do it on this level um, and then what do I hope they take from my songs man those those I love I'm the biggest sucker for the end of the day golden hour riding home with the windows down and I have my favorite record on or my favorite songs on and uh, I'm standing and, I, and I'm I get it's like my moment, and as a songwriter, to just kind of be vulnerable, I guess, when when I'm by myself driving, and uh, so I write, I try to write songs for those moments and uh, melodies for those moments that make those feel. You feel so much at that time when you're listening to those songs, and um, I hope that they feel that same thing when they come to the shows.